turn to John 18, if you will, please, because that's where we are at this point in our study in the Gospel of John. Remember, it's Passover time. And when Passover arrived, thousands of Jewish people from all over the Roman Empire would funnel into Jerusalem. Most of them were camping out in temporary shelters because there wasn't, uh, there wasn't places to house them all. Well, chapter 18, set in Passover, just prior to the Lord's crucifixion. And you'll note in verse 1, it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, that is referring to the prayer that he offered in chapter 17, that he went forth with his disciples over the book Cedron or over the Kedron, the Kidron, K-I-D-R-O-N is another way of pronouncing it. And in that Kidron, that was a valley and a stream at times would run through it during the rainy season. And so this is what he's talking about here. It records Jesus and his disciples crossing the Kidron Valley, which is a valley on the east side of Jerusalem, uh, between the Temple Mount and what is called the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Garden of Gethsemane is really just a, an olive grove, uh, still exists today. He went there to shelter in this olive grove, and of course, significant events follow. John doesn't mention Jesus' prayer in that olive grove in the Garden of Gethsemane, like the other gospel writers do. But uh, let me tell you, Gethsemane, the place where he was arrested, the place where he prayed, the word Gethsemane means olive press. And it gives really an illustration of what was going on inside of our Lord. He was pressed in his soul beyond measure by the demonic powers that were attacking him. Uh, and of course, in anticipation of being joined with all sin of the entire human race, he was pressed beyond measure. I want to look at uh, three things in this chapter. First of all, the betrayal of Jesus, and then the denial of Jesus, and then the trial of Jesus, those three, after we pause and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can come before you once again this morning. We thank you for our Savior and all that he endured for us on our behalf to bring us out of darkness to light, out of sin, and make us his saints. We thank you for the forgiveness, for the deliverance, for the wonderful future that we have in store for us, reserved in heaven. What an inheritance we have as believers. Now, I pray that today you would undertake for this time that we spend together, use it, Lord, take the hardness from our hearts. Take the cynicism out of our hearts. Take the pride out of our hearts and humble us so that we do not resist what the Holy Spirit has to say to each one of us, but rather we would say with humility, Lord, here's my heart. Speak to it. Teach me. Put your word in my heart and seal it there and use it in the days ahead. Lord, may that be our prayer to you today as we look to you and ask it all for your sake. In the name of Jesus, amen. So the first 11 verses really are about the betrayal. And of course, the leader here is Judas. He leads this, it says a band. Notice that it says a band of men in verse three. A band of men uh, could also be translated a cohort, a Roman cohort with 600 men. I'm not saying that there were that many that uh, Judas was leading to Jesus, but there were a lot, okay? There were a lot of men. It says in that third verse, officers, 
from the chief priests and Pharisees as well. There was not only the temple guards, but there was also Roman soldiers. This is what this band of men is referring to. Now, Judas, he's the one that is guilty of the 12 for betraying the Lord, which means that he was pretending to love Jesus. All the while, deep down in his heart, he really didn't. He was pretending to be a believer and a follower of Jesus when it wasn't true. It was all a show. He was doing it to for whatever reasons, obviously selfish reasons, to bring about what he wanted. The Bible says Jesus lets us know that he was a thief. And so this guy did not have a changed heart. And so he has a heart of betrayal. But I want you to understand, in the betrayal of Jesus, there are two things at work here. And you must never forget this. There is at work the divine sovereignty. There is the sovereign control of God in all situations, but there is also at work human responsibility. Whatever we do, it's our responsibility to own it and to face up to it. And so let's look at these two at work here in the betrayal. First of all, the divine sovereignty. It becomes very clear to me that Jesus is in total control of this situation, even the betrayal and the arrest that uh, that took place. And it reminds me of what uh, Peter says in his sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. He says about Jesus that he was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. That's what he says. It was divine sovereignty at work when Jesus was betrayed and when he was arrested there in that olive grove called Gethsemane. And it is so clearly fully evidenced that he was sovereign and in control of the entire event. And I want to show you why. First of, because he was willing. He was willing to be betrayed. He was willing to be arrested. He was willing to go with them to trial. And I want you to pick up with me in the fourth verse, because here it says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, he had a foreknowledge of all that was going to come to pass regarding this. And what does he do? Based upon his foreknowledge, he went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, verse 5, Jesus of Nazareth. Then he saith unto them, and notice the word he is in italics, because it's not in the original original language of the New Testament. He basically said, I am. (laughs) We know what that means, right? Seven I am's in the gospel of John. The gospel is built around those seven I am's. Uh, one of which I am, the resurrection and the life, right? When he says that, look at what happens. Oh, by the way, you should note that among that band of men, among those uh, temple guards, officers, and, uh, and religious leaders, there was one that stood out among them, Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Don't want to miss that. But what happens when Jesus takes the initiative and confronts them? Who are you looking for? Not that he didn't know. And he identifies himself as the one. Verse six says, as soon as he said unto them, I am, they went backward and fell to the ground. It's like Jesus is crawling up into their lap. He is deliberately, willingly giving himself into their hands. They're not in charge of this situation. This is divine sovereignty at work here. He is the one that is sacrificing himself, but he is doing it on the basis of his own personal choice. 
It's like he said in John chapter 10 and verse 18, I have the power in and of myself to lay down my life. I have the power to take it up again in resurrection. And this is what he's doing. He is in total control of the situation. He's sovereign here. And uh, when he offers himself, when he says, I am, something supernatural happens. I don't know what happened to these guys other than what the Bible says. They stepped backward and they fell on their backs, unconscious. His enemies fell backward instead of arresting him at that moment. We also note that when he does get arrested, he says to them that uh, in verse 8, I've told you I'm he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. So he's in control not only of the moment when he gets arrested, but he's also protecting his 11 disciples that are left. Just as he prayed for them in John 17, now he is arranging for them to be able to dissipate and leave and not be arrested with him. He's protecting his own, their freedom. If that isn't enough, let's continue on. Again, verse 7, he says, who do you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. They came to. They came out of their trance. And Jesus in verse 8, I told you, I am. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way, that that saying might be fulfilled, which he spake of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Verse 10, then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. We even know the name. The servant's name was Malchus. Then Jesus said to Peter, put up your sword into the sheaf. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Here's another evidence of divine sovereignty. Because even John doesn't tell us this, but when you look at the other gospels, you know what Jesus does? Okay, the guy's ear is probably laying on the ground. Cut off his right ear. I guess he's a bad shot. I guess he was going for the neck and he hit the ear instead. But anyway, the idea is that Jesus must have reached down and picked up the man's ear, stopped the blood, put the ear back in place, and it was like it never happened. Another picture of divine sovereignty that is given to us. The ear is reattached and instantly healed. That's who this is that they're arresting. So you see, they're not taking him by force. He is willingly submitting to them. He is surrendering to them. And he says it in verse 11. Why? This is the cup, not that man has given me to drink, but this cup of suffering, this cup of, of, of death is from the Father. And I am being obedient to the Father. Shall I not drink the cup which the Father has given me? And yes, he will not only drink it, but he will drink it down to the last dreg on that cross. Willingly. What a picture of his sovereignty. But also, not only is there that he is willing but when you picture divine sovereignty, you must also balance it with the fact that he's willing, but he's also loving. His sacrifice was not the result of fate. That's obvious. It was not because he was overpowered. He doesn't hang on that cross because the nails are making him stay there. But he is lovingly, voluntarily sacrificing himself because he chose to do so. He chose to obey the plan that he and the Father devised from all eternity. He loved us and gave himself for us. That's what is entailed in this divine sovereignty. He's willing, he's loving. But now let's look at the other side of the coin. Let's talk about 
human responsibility because there's a lot of that going on here too. Just because God is sovereign doesn't let man off the hook. Man is responsible for his actions. In fact, that passage in Acts 2, 23, that I stopped after the ter- determinate counsel of God as the, re- the reason for the crucifixion. But the verse goes on to say, who was taken by wicked and lawless hands, crucified. There's human responsibility, whether it be Judas or all the others that are involved in Jesus's arrest and mistreatment and crucifixion, because people are always about advancing their own plan for totally selfish reasons, whether it be Judas, whether it be the religious leaders, uh, the Romans, whoever, human beings are always about advancing their own selfish plans for their reasons, for personal advantage. Now, the fact that we read in this passage, verse 4, that Jesus knew ahead of time all things that were going to come upon him, that Jesus foreknew all that was going to happen to him. Knowing beforehand, understand this, knowing beforehand does not equal determining beforehand what will happen. That God knows all that's going to happen does not mean that God determines all that happens. In fact, God is sovereign, and God has sovereignly chosen to let divine imagers like you and I have the capacity to act independently of his direct control. He sovereignly chooses us to give to, to have the ability to freely make choices either for or against God. But we're held responsible for all of our choices. The lost, if they don't repent, will answer for their choice to reject God and to reject Jesus. And did you know that if you're a believer, carnal believers will not only miss the joy and peace of the abundant life now, but they'll lose eternal reward as well, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 teaches us. So there is divine sovereignty in this betrayal, but there's also human responsibility, and we can't overlook either of them. Well, let's drop down to Peter. And his denial, that's the betrayal. Look at the denial with me. Pick up in verse uh, 12, the band of uh, and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus, bound him. They led him away to Annas. He's a former high priest of of Israel. They led him first to Annas. He was the father-in-law to Caiaphas. And Caiaphas was the current high priest at the time. it says, and verse 14, Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus. So did the other, another disciple. That, that We don't know who that disciple is. Some think it's John, but I'm wondering if it's John, because whoever this disciple is, he had an in with the high priest. He had a relationship with with the high priest. Maybe it was Nicodemus who this other disciple is. I don't know. But uh, just food for thought. Speculation, however, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But Peter stood, it says, verse 16, at the door without, then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, art thou also one of the man's disciples? He said, I am not. So here is Peter. This is his first denial. Um, Why did he do it? I think there are some logical reasons why he denied the Lord, not once, not twice, but three times. I think, first of all, it was the result of him being too proud to admit and thus ignoring spiritual truth. Because Jesus warned him in advance of it, you know what, Peter? Satan's at work here, 
I want you to understand Satan's at work here and he is going to try to sift you as wheat. He's going to try to prove you as worthless, no good. He's going to sift you as wheat. But Peter, I prayed for you that your faith doesn't fail. And so he warned Peter, but Peter didn't believe it. Or Peter ignored that spiritual truth, and that really sets up denial on his part. He needed a new mindset in order to be prepared for this onslaught of spiritual, really, spiritual oppression that he was facing here. Actually, I see Peter rebelling in that earlier part of this passage where Peter pulls his sword out of his sheath and swings it and cuts off the high priest servant's ear. And Jesus saying, Peter, stop, put your sword away. You don't understand. Peter never understood, at least prior to Pentecost. He didn't get it. Peter's sword swinging is really, I think, an example of his rebellion against the will of God. He rebelled against the will of God when Jesus said, I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer. No, this isn't going to happen to you. Peter, I need to wash your feet. No, you're never going to wash my feet. Peter was a rebel in his heart, just like you are and just like I am. We are rebellious naturally against all that God wants to do. You rebel against God's authority. You rebel against authority figures that God puts in your life. You don't like submitting because that's the human heart. If we're honest with ourselves, we're a bunch of rebels. And Peter is rebelling. He's rebelling against the will of God. He's fighting the wrong enemy when he yanks that sword out. Our battle is not with flesh and blood. You think you have an enemy that's flesh and blood, and you may, but the real enemy behind it isn't flesh and blood. He's fighting with the wrong weapons. He's fighting with a literal sword When Jesus said, uh, buy a sword, he meant you need a new spiritual defense. These physical swords aren't going to do it. You can't win the battles that you are in as a believer with physical means. You need spiritual means. You ignore the spiritual unseen realm, and you are falling flat in defeat. He's rebelling against his, uh, he's fighting the wrong enemy. He's fighting with the wrong weapons. He's fighting with the wrong motives. And he fails because he argued with Jesus about his own spiritual vulnerability. And remember when Jesus was crying out in the garden with such pressure on his soul, he said, I, I, I'm, I have such burden. I feel like I'm ready to die. You know what Peter was doing? sawing logs. He was snoring. He was sleeping instead of praying. And Jesus said, pray that you enter not into temptation. Watch and pray that you enter not. So he was, he failed. He slept rather than prayed. Just like we do. We sleep rather than pray. And as a result, all of this contributed and set him up for a fall. His rebelling brought him to the place where he was denying. Three times he denied being a follower of Jesus. The first time here in verse 16, the uh, second time, or rather verse 17, the second time is in verse 25, where Simon Peter stood and he warmed himself. He was around the fire with with the enemies of the Lord, warming himself. Reminds me of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, that standeth not in the way of sinners. Here he is standing and warming himself. Verse 25 says, they said therefore unto him, art thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. That's the second time he denies. The third time is the next two verses, 26, 27. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off. Okay, so a relative of the high priest servant Malchus recognizes Peter because he must have been there in the band, in the group of men that arrested Jesus, and he recognizes Peter, and he says 
to him. Oh, didn't I see you in the garden with him? Peter denied it again, verse 27, and immediately the cock crew, the, ro the rooster crowed. What we don't get here is on the third occasion, the writer of the Gospels tell us that he not only denied it, but he did under oath in order to convince everyone in his hearing that he was telling the truth. It, you know, it, when it says that Peter swore, it means like we would to be called to take an oath in a court of law. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That's what he was doing when he denied the third time. Three denials, God records. You know, you can deny the Lord without ever saying a word. You can deny the Lord simply by being silent when you shouldn't be, when you should speak a word for the Lord, when you should stand for the Lord. Again, we don't get John's, doesn't give us the full story, but when you piece it all together by looking at the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what you realize is that when, I guess, Jesus was being brought from uh, the house of Caiaphas to Pilate, when he was being transferred from place to place, when he came out into that courtyard, he saw Peter. And Peter's eyes and the Lord's eyes met. And the Bible tells us in Luke that when Jesus looked at Peter. The look in Jesus' eyes broke him. And Peter went out and he wept bitterly. That's what Luke says. He wept bitterly. Just because the loving eyes of Jesus broke his heart based upon what he had just done three times, denying the Lord. Isn't it wonderful? We're not there yet, but the last chapter of the Gospel of John is he gets recommissioned. And there's wonderful restoration. God's not done with him, even though he denied the Lord three times. That should spark some hope in our hearts. But the rooster crowed, and now this rebelling, denying disciple is now weeping. He's weeping bitterly because of Jesus' look. Have you ever sensed disappointment in the eyes of Jesus? I'm not talking about a literal, literal eyes, but. Have you ever sensed that kind of feeling that Jesus is displeased with you and it broke your heart, brought you to tears? And you know what he's facing here. Well, the trial then, we didn't actually look at it. It's actually taking place already. He's led first to Annas in verse 13. <clears throat> and then we're not told any other details, but it says in verse 28, then they led him from Caiaphas to the hall of judgment, the trial of Jesus. It was a farce. Let me tell you, all the trials, six of them. Did you know that there were six trials and they were all fake? They were all drummed up. They were all false indictments. None of them were real. Uh, there were three that are the Gospels record three religious trials, one before Annas, the former high priest, the next before the current high priest Caiaphas, and the third one before the entire Sanhedrin, or council of Jewish leaders, religious leaders. And then there are three civil trials, one before Pilate, then Pilate sends him to Herod, and then Herod sends him back to Pilate. And so there's six trials that take place in order to condemn Jesus. The first one is at the high priest's house. Now, you have to understand this. Caiaphas and, and Annas are family. We are told that Caiaphas is uh, the father-in-law, uh, or rather is the son-in-law of Annas. We, we learned that in verse 13. So here's how it worked back in that day. Families lived together. Uh, Caiaphas Palace, or mansion, if you will. It, it uh, 
it, it had a uh, entryway, an atrium, and uh, there were rooms all around that. And then there was a central courtyard and there were rooms all around that called insula. So this was, I don't know, it could have been more than one story, could have been a couple of stories. But uh, they all, the families all lived together. They had separate living places, but they all lived in this insula gathered around a courtyard. And so that's what, where Jesus is taken. He's taken to Annas and Caiaphas, and it's really at the same place, the same mansion, the high priest's house. And in verses 12 to 14, uh, there is that presentation before the former high priest Annas, and I think it's an informal hearing. And then uh, he is taken before Caiaphas. This is all happening in the middle of the night. Where, where it happens under secret secrecy. Well, everyone else is asleep. This is going on because it's it's dark. What's happening here? It's dark. This is fake, and so it's happening when no one's watching. And uh, there is an examination that uh, they give in order to gain evidence to then bring him before the Sanhedrin, the 70 elders, so that they can uh, officially condemn him. And notice what he's asked about in verse 19. The high priest asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. First, ask him of his disciples. When Jesus answers, he says nothing about his disciples. Why? Because he doesn't want to bring them up. He doesn't want them in this. He wants them protected. He wants them to be out of the picture. And so he got them released in the olive grove, and he's not going to talk about them again. Instead, he addresses the question regarding his doctrine, and here's what he says, verse 20. Look, I, I, I didn't say anything in secret. I have spoken openly to the entire world. I taught in your synagogues. I taught in the temple in Jerusalem. And whether the Jews all, all already resort in secret, I haven't said anything. There's no secret message here. Verse 21. So why are you asking me what I taught? Ask the multitudes all around because they heard me. They know what I've said. And of course, for that, he gets hit by a servant of the, uh, high, uh, of the officers of the high priest, the temple guards. But that's what's going on here. But I think it's interesting also that John mentions, again, brings to us the fact that Caiaphas, the son-in-law of, of Annas, the, the current high priest of that day, verse 14, he was the one who gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. You remember that? That's John chapter 11. Listen to this. This is when Lazarus has been raised from the dead and it's, called, it's caused such a, a stir that they're afraid that people are going to be carried away with this Jesus. He raises a man that's been dead for four days. Here's what he says. Caiaphas, he says, you don't know anything at all, tells the others. You don't, you don't consider it's expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he, not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied, look, that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. What's he saying? This man doesn't know what he's saying, but he's prophesying that this Jesus has not only come to save Israel, but to save the nations of this earth. That he is the one that, that is in the plan of God, the one that will bring back the nations that have rebelled against God. He's the key to it. He's the key fulfillment of that promise made to Abram, that in you, your seed, your family, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And this man doesn't know what he's saying but he's the mouthpiece of God when he says this. 
And John brings it up again in this time in which Jesus is, is examined before them. And then beginning in verse 28 and really to the end of the chapter, he is before Pilate in John's gospel. Now, Pilate didn't reside in Jerusalem. He lived in Caesarea on the, the Mediterranean. And yet during the Passover season, because of the influx of people, hundreds of thousands of people that would come to Jerusalem, he would move from Caesarea and would stay in Jerusalem during that feast period in order to keep, to keep peace uh, in that uh, city. And so he would stay in a fortress, his headquarters, called the Fortress of, uh, of Antonia. He would stay there. And Jesus is brought to Pilate. It says in verse 28, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas under the Hall of Judgment. That's also called the Praetorium, the Hall of Judgment. It was early. And we know from the other Gospels that it was in the fourth hour or watch of the night, which is 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. They're bringing him before Pilate at that hour. And they won't go into the Gentile Roman headquarters because they don't want to be defiled. They want to be able to participate in Passover, verse 29. Pilate went out to them and he said, okay, so what's your accusation against this man? They answered and said, look, if he wasn't a criminal, uh, we wouldn't have delivered him un unto you. And Pilate said, well, you take him and judge him according to your law. Verse 31, the Jews therefore said, it's not lawful for us to put a man to death, that the saying might be fulfilled, verse 32, which he spake, saying, by what death he should die. And I think that is a reference to what Jesus predicted in John chapter 12, and I think it's verse 32, where he said, and I, if I be lifted up, meaning on the cross, I will draw all men to myself. And so he predicted that he would die on the cross. He would die by crucifixion. Verse 33, then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and he called Jesus and said, are you the king of the Jews? Evidently, that's what they said, that he, that they told Pilate that he was claiming to be the king of the Jews so that they could bring a, a political um, accusation against him. Notice what he says. He answers in verse 34, Sayest thou this of thyself, or did others tell it of me? Pilate answered, I a Jew. Your own nation and your chief priests have delivered you unto me. What have you done? And Jesus answers this question, Are you the king of the Jews? Verse 36, My kingdom is not of this world. In fact, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate said, are you the king then? Jesus answered, verse 37, thou sayest I am a king. To this end I was born, and for this cause came I unto the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth, and everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. He's claiming to be a king, but not the kind of king that Pilate would uh, think of. He says, my kingdom currently is not of this world. I'm the king of, in the spiritual realm, and I have a spiritual kingdom. And by the way, just for your information, he is not denying the fact that one day in the future, he will be the king of a literal, physical, earthly kingdom because that's a promise that he gave to Israel. And he never breaks his promises. But he's simply saying, at this point, my kingdom, the time has not come for it to be an earthly one. But remember, he is, as in Daniel chapter 2, uh, he is, as in Luke 19, that, that stone that, uh, that is cut out of the mountain that will roll over the kingdoms of this world and crush them and grind them to powder. That's not the time. Here, my kingdom, he says, is not of this world. Ultimately, it's a spiritual kingdom, not denying a future earthly one. Well, he says, I've come to bear witness to the truth. Pilate says the famous question, verse 38, what is truth? 
I think he said that cynically. I don't think he really wanted an answer. I, I think he's saying, you know, that your truth, my truth, what's truth? You know, and uh, but when it's all said and done, notice this. Verse 39, Pilate goes to the Jewish leaders. He said, you have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? He's trying to get Jesus off the hook. He's trying not to crucify Jesus like they wanted him executed. He's trying not to have to execute him. And they cried out, verse 40, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas, it says, was a robber. He was a murderer, too. The Gospels tell us he was guilty of murder, and he was guilty of insurrection against the Roman government. And they want him instead of Jesus. Pilate hopes to pardon Jesus, but he is such a weak man and does only what is expedient for him to stay in power and control the mob, and so he gives in to their plan. So that's the betrayal, that's the denial, and that's the trial in a nutshell. But it really brings us to this, and, and this is the important part that I want to personally apply to all of us, and that's this. Pilate's trying to find out who Jesus is. Are you the king of the Jews? What's your conclusion? You say, oh, you know what my conclusion is. You know, I professed Jesus a long time ago. I was even baptized. What do you think of Christ? Years ago on a TV talk show, the head of the Church of England, the Archbishop of Canterbury, they call him, was speaking with actress Jane Fonda. And he, he said, Jesus is the Son of God, you know. And Fonda replied, well, maybe he is for you, but he's not for me. And the archbishop answered, and he said, well, either he is or he isn't. Well, that's true. That's true. It's also true that whether you believe he is or not, he still is the son of God, whatever your opinion is. The fact of the matter is, what you think or who you think Jesus is is really evident in the way you live your life. It's not what you say. It's not what you claim. You can say anything, but convince me by living a life that shows, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus is the King. That Have you surrendered to him? as the king of your life? Have you surrendered your little fiefdom, your little kingdom over to God, that he could rule over every part of it? So you might believe, yes, he's the king. Yes, he's the son of God. Yes, he's the Lord. He's the Lord of all. Yeah? What does that look like in your daily life? How does that affect your choices? How does that affect the way you treat people? The way you deal with situations, the way you deal with pressures that come upon you, the way you deal with worry and concern and sickness and financial difficulties. I mean, and the list is endless. Where does the lordship of Jesus Christ show up in your daily life? Who is Jesus to you? 